open your Bibles this morning to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, we're going to look at what defiles a man, uh, I can't hide behind the podium this morning, I'm out here where you can see me, all right, what defiles a man, as we look at this portion of scripture, we see these first 20 verses in chapter 15, it talks about what defiles a man, makes a man unholy. And as we look at religion, there's two approaches to religion. And if you stop and think about what the uh, Jews were like as they went through the Old Testament, they had the law. What did the law do? It says, do this, do this. And they had all their regulations about cleanliness, everything, but it was all external. So we get to the New Testament, now we go from the external to the internal. And that's, as we look at religion, I just got a couple things here that one stresses the outside, the other stresses the inside, these two different religions. And a couple examples I wrote down is externally, if a person keeps the outside clean, then the inside will be clean. Hmm, sounds good, doesn't it? If a person is clean on the inside, think about the other side of the coin, then the inside, see, if a person is clean on the inside, then he will keep the outside clean. Follow that? In other words, if I'm clean, if I'm living right, okay, if I'm looking out there, and, and uh, as far as the world's concerned, I'm living a moral life, uh, I'm obeying all the laws and everything, and I go to church and I do everything. If I, as long as I'm right out here, then the inside's going to be right. And uh, the other idea is that if the inside is right, then what I do out here will be evidenced by what's inside. But the other example I had was uh, externally uh, is a man-made uh, religion of ritual, ceremony, laws, and works. And that means that everything I do, how I live, how people see me, how they perceive me as I live this life, that's externally. And internally is God's religion based upon his son, Jesus Christ, who changes and recreates the heart of man, a heart that reaches out to both God and man in love and respect. So we see the difference in ideas and religion and all religions. If you go to anything but Christianity, all of them have a works-related way to approach God. You live right, you do this, you do that, you, you go to church, you give to, your, give to the church. But if it's all external, if it's all out here and not inside, then it's not worth anything. You know, I heard a, a preacher talking the other day and talking about people that they pray to get saved. You know, we get them to the altar. And sometimes I've been there where they may practically grab people by the neck and make them pray a prayer to be saved. But you know, the thing about that is, and the prayer, there's nothing wrong with the prayer, I'm not saying that. But if it's not from the heart, it doesn't make any difference. And so we hear the words, but you know, there's one final test, and that's does God accept it or reject it? See, a lot of people, and we read that over in Matthew 7, we talk about it a lot. A lot of people are living the kind of life they think they're going to heaven because they're doing all the things that they think needs to be done. But the problem of it is they haven't had that change of heart. They have not had a regenerated heart. They might have had a reformation, but not a regeneration. So as we look at this portion of scripture, we're going to see here to start. Well, let's go over to chapter 15 and the, the first verse there. It says, then came <coughs> to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, so here we see the scribes, the, these are the religionists. These are the people that would be part of the external part. They're worried about what's going on outside, obey all these laws. And what happened over the years the Pharisees added more and more laws. And the one law that we're looking at here today has to do with cleanliness using the water. The idea is that uh, they, they were concerned with the outside, and that's where they were at. They, if they would have come to Christ and understood what he was teaching, they would have realized that it was inside that would bring the outside to where it needed to be. So here they come to Jesus now, and they got a problem. He says, why do, verse 2, why do thy uh, disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. The tradition says you wash your hands before you eat. Well, apparently they saw Jesus' disciples eating a meal. And it might have been when they was going through the, uh, the fields and, and picking grain and eating it as they went. But whatever, they saw them and they ate something without washing their hands. And how could you do that? Tradition says you always wash your hands. And so they're all upset with, uh, with Jesus and his disciples. And they're questioning him about this man-made tradition. So Jesus, he doesn't really answer them there. He kind of points them in a new direction. He says, but he, Jesus, yeah, answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your transition, trans tradition? And what he's telling them is, you're, you're looking at tradition, 
and the violating the commandments of God. You're putting tradition over God's commandment. You're putting tradition over the word of God. And a lot of religions do that. Tradition seems to carry a lot of weight in a lot of religions, so they, they worry about that. So Jesus says, why, why, what's more important? Okay, What's more important, a man-made law or God's commandments? Which should have the greater impact in your life? Well, we know there's laws that we have to obey, but he's talking about a tradition here that man come up with to, to try to get people to do what they need to do so they could look right. They're wanting to do something to approach God. So he says, you're, you're violating uh, God's commandments. For God commanded, saying, honor thy father and thy mother. We know that. That's one of the commandments, fifth commandment. And he says there, he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. And we could go over and look at Exodus 20, and we would see that over there. The idea is you worry about tradition and you violate one of the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother. If you curse father and mother, let him die the death. So we look at how this is all coming out. And for God commanded, saying, Honor father and mother. He that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. By that that's a little hard to understand what they're saying unless you understand uh, what the commandment really had to do with. I have a, just to read this to you, uh, to kind of paraphrase a little bit. But you say, whosoever tells his father or mother, everything I have that might be used for helping you is devoted to God. Is under no obligation at all to help his parent. And what he's saying is, you take all of your wealth, all of everything you have, and you say, I'm devoting it to God. When you do that, then you tell mom and dad, if they need something, say, well, I would love to help you, but I've taken all my resources and I'm devoting them to God. So I can't take it from God. That would be, that would be breaking the vow to God. So I can't take it from him and give it to you. So you see here how they, how they get around the commandment. See, what man, man has a way of, of taking the word of God and, and twisting it and taking it out of context. We, we hear a lot of times people talk about, uh, I had people witness to, and, and they say, well, here, here's, here's what the Bible says. But if you take it in context, what is God really trying to say? And what he's trying to say right here is that we, a part of this uh, environment we live in, mother-father relationship, we're to honor our parents. But people that are selfish, what they want to do is they don't want to give to their parents. They want to have it for themselves. And so, you see, here, you're worried about somebody washing their hands and breaking a tradition, and then you go out about and you come up with these rules and have to set somebody free from that obligation when they say, well, I'm going to give all my money to God. I'm, com I'm committing it to God so I can't help mom and dad. So, therefore, that fifth commandment's out the window. Don't need to worry about it, right? So, what's he trying to tell us? What is he trying to say? Go to verse 7. Ye, what? Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah, Isaiah's here in New Testament, Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is from, far from me. And, and we have that over in, in uh, Isaiah. I just want to read that verse to you, and, and it goes a little bit deeper than that. But he says, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear or reverence towards me is taught by the precepts of the teaching of, of men. And so what's happened is, when the, he talks about that, when we look at the idea of following uh, a different rule, a different uh, pattern, he says, you're following what men want you to do. You're listening to what men want you to do, so you're, you're hypocrites. You make it look like you're honoring God. You go to, we can use it in the 21st century, you go to church on Sunday morning, uh, you walk out the church doors and the rest of the week you don't worry about God. You don't worry about anything about him. He says, you come in and you sing praises and you talk about how much you love the Lord. But it goes back to what we started off with in this sentence. The heart is not there. See, the guy, and we've been studying experiencing God on Wednesday night, Henry Blackaby's book, and, and going through that. And we see the, the idea of, of the, how you let God rule your life. How we let God, he talked about being sovereign, how God is sovereign in our life, and he does allow us to make decisions, but he is always in control. 
And so the idea is that we look at what he wants us to do. He wants the heart that's right toward him. And if we want to see a difference in America, if we want to see a difference in society, the heart has to be changed. We can make all the rules you want to make. You make all the laws you want to make about anything in the Bible. But if the heart of those that hear those rules and those laws isn't changed, it's not going to make a difference in society. And we see that evidence, don't we? We see that evidence, and as we see uh, more and more of society is moving farther and farther from the things of God. We look at what's happening in America today with Christianity, even around the world, but right in our own nation, how Christianity is being looked down upon because something weird, something that's, that's radical. You know, it was, it's kind of ironic if you uh, study Roman Catholicism, and, and they have a... Uh, they do, some of them do mass in Latin. That's the way it was originally. And then the more modern ones, they do it in, in English. But here, uh, last year, year before, uh, they, any Catholic church that used Latin in their mass was considered radical and might be problematic in being in our nation because they used Latin in their mass. Whether you agree with the Catholicism or not, they have a right to use what they want, English or Latin, because that's part of their, their religion, that's part of their the way they worship. And so, it, but he's telling us that here. He says, you, you draw night, you, you make it seem like come to me. But in verse 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They get, you're getting away from the word of God and you're getting over here into tradition. You're getting over here into what, may, uh, what makes you feel good. You want to appeal to society. You want to be out there where people look at you and you'll be more acceptable need to kind of watch what you talk about. Kind of stay away from the word of God. So we, we look and he calls them. He says, what are you? You're hypocrites. We hear a lot of people talk about that. Say, well, the Christians, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. Well, that's true. We're not sinless. But the idea, we want to be sure that we base our, our lifestyle, base our way we live, based upon the word of God. Not traditions, not, not man's wisdom, but on God's word. And traditions aren't all bad. That's not what I'm saying. Some traditions are good traditions, but we don't, we don't want to allow them to get in the way of the word of God. So we see as he gets down through there, and let's go a little bit further. Now here he was talking to the, the religionists. These are all these people that, that believe in religion. And so we get down here to verse uh, number 10. He says here, and he called the multitude. So now he's going to talk to everybody. Uh, everybody out there, saved, unsaved, he, come on in, I want to talk to you about something. And he said to them, hear and understand. Now, he just gets back, we're getting into the word, we talk about the word defile. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So when you, you worry about my, my disciples eating with unwashed hands, he said, that, that has nothing to do with it. It's not what goes in, but it's what comes out that makes a difference. He says here the, the idea of a, of a foul mouth. He talks about the, the food, and we're going to look at some things here. Uh, over in uh, Romans 14, 17, he says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We talk about what, how man talks. He says, what comes out of your mouth? And, of course, what comes out of our mouth is what? Words. The words is what we come out, comes out of our mouth. And he talks about how that can uh, defile a man. Curse words. You know what curse words? Filthy words, critical, deceptive, harsh, unkind, uncaring words. Those all are the things that come out of the mouth, and we, we see what he's talking about. He says that, that comes out of your mouth. That's what defiles a man. That's what makes you unholy. That's what makes you where you, you, don't, you don't fit in. To defile, it says to make common, to make unholy, unclean, to become polluted and defiled. What makes a man unholy? What does it mean to be unholy? It means that you're not separated to God. You're not separated uh, to, for God's use because of the condition that you're in. You see this idea of being using those words, and the words are reflective of who we are. James 3.9 says this, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Listen, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. It says, My brethren, these things ought not to be so. He says, it comes out of, out of the heart. He said, out, out of this mouth, at one time he can be singing praises to God and blessing God and, and doing all those things. And then uh, the next minute you turn around and there's uh, the other things coming out of the mouth. And see, that it reflects right back to what we said in verse 7. He says right there, he says, you're hypocrites. 
You're hypocrites. You're, the way you talk, the way you act. And he's talking to the, the general public here right now. He's talking to the multitude. He says, you're all hypocrites. You, you're speaking in a way out of your mouth that's coming in these things that aren't, aren't beneficial. We hear so much of the, the idea in today's environment. How, how much toleration do we have for other people's views anymore? What do you hear today coming when you in politics? I don't care in, in society. It's so much hatred. People people can't stand if you don't agree, especially on the left. If you don't agree with what they're saying in this woke culture, they just go bananas. They can't believe that you don't agree with them. And right away they want to they want to you're you're a MAGA or you're a Christian or you're something else. They want to kick. What happened to people that? that don't talk like this, don't act like this, but have a heart of love for one another. See, where, just a, this is a question, where is the influence of the church in society today? Where do you see it? Where do you see an influence of the church in society today? I'm hard pressed to tell you, I don't know. I can't, I can't look out in society and there might be, you might find a, a, a little pocket here or something over here. But in society in general today, where is the influence of the church? Where are we making a difference in the world today? Uh, we just talking, you heard probably this last week down in uh, Louisiana, the governor down there signed a bill. They're going to put the Ten Commandments in all the schools. And right away, the, what is it, the, the, human, the rights people, the, you see, not, what is it? Uh, yeah. That's it. I knew I'd think about it. <laughs> but right away, they're all up in the air, all up in the air. Why? Why? Well, you can't be having this church state that you can't be doing that. The Ten Commandments, tell me what's violent about the Ten Commandments. What what are the Ten Commandments? You take the last five or the last six actually have to do with society. Which one of those would you say, I don't want you to obey this, you go do this the opposite? Thou shalt not kill. Hey, go kill somebody. That's all right. Thou shalt not steal. Hey, if you want to take it. What, what happened to society when we have to get so upset over something that's being told that's good? Because it don't fit the culture today. It makes people uncomfortable. And I hear people say, well, you know, people are basically good. No, they're not basically good. Basic, men, men is not basically good. Man is basically rotten. He doesn't care about God. We see that right off the bat. They, men don't care about God until God touches you. I didn't care about God. I didn't blaspheme or anything else. I didn't care about him. I knew he was there. I knew he was real. Until he reached out and touched me and I got saved, then it all changed. And so he's talking to this multitude and he said, this is, this, is what you gotta, this is what's happening. This is what defiles a man. It makes you common, unholy, unclean. So go to it down to verse 12. Now he's talking to his disciples. See, we've got three different groups of people he's talking to here in, in these 20 verses. First he talked to the religionists. Now he's talking to the multitude. And now he comes down here to verse 12. He talks to his disciples. And he came, and then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Well, Jesus, do you realize what you just did? Those people are mad at you. You've done hurt their feelings when you call them hypocrites. When you told them that, that they were not living right, that they were not doing right, that they put tradition over God, you hurt their feelings. You upset them. And Jesus said, well, I am sure sorry. Man, I did not mean to make anybody upset. Hmm? Did he say that? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. These weren't planted. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind I lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And what's he saying is these are the religionists. And they're living out all these laws and all these rules. And the people are following them. They're thinking that if they do enough right, if they live enough right, that they're going to be okay with God. He said, and they're blind themselves. And they have people following them that are blind. And what's going to happen is they're both going to be destroyed. He said, well, that's not right because uh, the, the Pharisees are misleading people. They're deceiving people. You know, uh, one thing about God, he, he's kind of different from our society today. He says everybody's responsible for themselves. You're not, that, that leader, he may be teaching you wrong, and he'll be held accountable for that, but you're responsible to find the truth. 
See, we get the idea that just because somebody told me to do something and it wasn't right, then they're responsible. No, no, that's not right. You're responsible for it. They might have convinced you to do something or did something to get you to do what they wanted you to do, but you, in the end, you're responsible. We live in a society today where people aren't responsible anymore. We find excuses. Well, he couldn't do that because, well, look how he was raised. He was raised poor and beaten down, or she was raised poor and beaten down. They were abused. All these excuses, and there's reason. I'm not saying there's not reasons for different things, but when you treat people differently, but when it comes down to it, it's the word of God that needs to be lived out, and so we are responsible for ourselves. But we don't want to do that. So that's what he's telling. He says, you know what? Don't worry about if we made them upset. Don't worry about if they got mad about it and got all up in the air. He said that they're, lead, they're blind leaders. Spiritually, they're leading these people blindly into the ditch. And then Peter, here's Peter, he always speaks up. He says, then answered Peter and said unto him, declare unto us this parable. Explain this to us, will you? And he says, Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding? Peter, don't you understand anything? Do not ye understand that whatsoever entereth and at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the draught or in the sewer. But, you know, people worry about what you eat. We want to eat healthy. We want to be, uh, do things right and everything. But uh, the idea is that, that that's not going to make you more spiritual. What you eat, I don't make you any more spiritual. We have to watch what we do eat and be careful. But... He said, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unholy. It's not what goes into your mouth that causes you to be unworthy, no. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. They pollute the man. They make the man, the woman, unholy. See, what all the, as we look at all that we're talking about here, he says, this is what the difference is. Go back to what I said originally back in, we talked about what's in and out. See, it makes a difference what the heart is like. Is it, is it from the inside? Am I, do I have a regenerated heart? Do I have a new heart? If I have the same old heart, the, these, this thing is going to, I'm going to be defiled by the things I say and the way I act. He said, you don't, what it goes in is what comes out of your heart that makes a difference. Jesus talks about that all the time. When we look at the, all of his teachings, what, what is Christ really talking about? He's talking about a changed heart. We look at the Beatitudes. We look at the Sermon on the Mount. All those things he talks about, you know, about adultery, about murder, and all those things. It's a changed heart that makes a difference. And so, believe it or not, uh, when a person gets saved, there has to be, there must be, there's required that there is a change in your life. Now, you may be a good moral person. You may live an upright life and do everything right. But I want to tell you what, when you get saved, there's going to be a change in your attitude. There's going to be a change in the way you look at things. There's going to be a change in the way you relate to God and to other believers. If there's not, you better go back, as Paul says, go back and check your salvation. Hmm? Look at who you are and what you've done. Be sure be sure that you're saved. Be sure you're born again. Be sure you have that new heart. That's it. You're not sinless, and you're not going to be sinless. You're going to say some things that you shouldn't say. You're going to do some things that you shouldn't do, but it's not going to be a lifestyle. See, that's the difference. It's not going to be a... Disobedience is not a lifestyle to the child of God. Again, it gets back to sinlessness, and we know that's not a true thing, but we know that our lifestyle has changed. What we used to like, we don't like anymore. We have a different appetite for the things of life, and we have a different focus on our life. And this should be evident, especially, listen, especially to you. You know, the other people might look around, and and they might say, well, I don't see much difference in him or her. But to you... It has to be noticed. You have to feel the difference in your life by the way that you look at the things around you. I definitely did. When I come to know Christ as my Savior, I definitely looked at the world in a different way. I definitely looked, you know, it wasn't the, all the things I was doing bad or anything, but it was the way I related to the church. I went to church for years and years and years and years and years. All my life, practically, I've been in church. It took 45 years. 45 years before I finally got from there to here. Hmm? 
God reached out and touched me and it changed my whole life. And the, the blessing, if you would, of getting saved later in life is you know what you were and you know you see the change in your own life. Even my wife noticed the difference. I was a little bit better after I got saved. No, but that's, that's what he's telling us about right here. See, that's the difference. It's what goes in. He said that the heart. What comes forth out of the heart, that's what defiles a man. Uh, for out of the heart, let's go to verse 19, we'll get finished here. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. I'm not going to break down all those. Those are pretty uh, obvious what, they, what he's saying there. But he says what happens, is, and especially the first part, out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts. Those thoughts, those things that get into our mind, and we get, you ever have something, you get something on your mind and you just can't get rid of it? You know, something's really weighing you down and it may be good, it may be bad, whatever it is, but you just can't get rid of it and you just go over and over and over in your mind and it finally just kind of beats you up. He said these evil thoughts that come out of our mind, that, that comes from our heart. We have that heart, the murders, adulteries, fornication, all these kind of things. It comes from the heart. It's an evidence of what's in your heart. And so what if, what if you've done something that you got saved and you did one of these things? Well, it, listen, what I said earlier holds true. It, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. We have, we have a different life. We're not living out in disobedience day in and day out. Yeah, again, it gets back to the sinlessness part of it. But the idea is not living a, a perfect life, but it's striving to live a perfect life. David, my, my favorite example is David. What did he say about David. David was a man, what, after God's own heart, wasn't he? David was a man after God's own So David must have lived a perfect life or he wouldn't have been a man after God's own heart, was he? Huh. David was about as rotten as anybody could be. But go back to the story of Bathsheba and Uriah and you're familiar with all that. Look what he did at different times in his life. Look what he did. David was not a perfect person. But you know what was different about David than most like Saul and others? David had a heart for God. David knew that when he violated God's laws, when he violated, did, when he sinned, when he did wrong, he knew that he was sinning against a holy God. Yeah, he hurt Uriah and he hurt Bathsheba and all others, his three sons and that. He hurt them in consequence of his sin. But you know what? He had the heart for God. He knew that I hurt God. I, I did against, sinned against God. And he recognized that and he would work to get back to where he needed to be. See, that's what I think so many times what we have a problem understanding is that we don't want to be confronted with our sin and we really don't want to get rid of our sin. You know, there's, do you ever have, I used this illustration several times, but you know, when you get saved, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, right? He moves and he comes right on, he moves in. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes in, we talk about being filled then. So the Holy Spirit comes, you just got saved and you got to use your house, your your body is a two-story house. So he comes in there and you give him, the, here's the first floor. Whatever you want to change, you change. You clean it up, you make it what you want it to be. But don't go upstairs. And then as we grow and we get more sanctified, we're going through that process of sanctification. And so we say, okay, you can go upstairs and there's, there's two bedrooms down on any. You go down and clean him up and do what you want to, but don't bother the rest of it. And finally, when we're getting really sanctified, say, okay, Go upstairs and make it just like you want it. Clean everything up. Make it. Like, but the closet, do not touch that closet because what's in that closet is something I don't want to let go of. And what happens is, over a period of time, we might we might isolate that closet. We might push that closet away. But you know what happens? That closet is always there, and what's in that closet is always in our heart. And pretty soon it starts drawing at us. And Satan says, "You know what? You better go check that closet. And make sure it's still in there." Make sure you still feel the same way. And so we start backsliding, they say. We start drifting. We need to be sure that we stay focused. And so these kind of things, when our heart's right, yeah, we might be tempted, you might be drawn, but we have to have the spiritual strength to say, no, I'm not going back there. Don't always work. Sometimes we fail. But you know the great thing about God and what a lot of people don't understand? We have a God that loves us, his son died for us, and he has an unconditional love for his children. He knows we're not perfect. 
If he, if he thought that if he believed and he wanted us to be perfect when we got saved, he wouldn't have put First John 1, 9 in there, would he? If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. He wouldn't put that in there because we wouldn't need it. If, I got, if a Christian was sinless after he got saved, then you wouldn't ever need to be forgiven of anything. Again, it doesn't bother the relationship, but it sure messes up the fellowship. We're finishing up right there in verse 20. Uh, These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. See, I took him around all the way around back to the second verse, didn't he? He said, this is what's wrong. You want to know what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with society? This is what's wrong. The heart of man is not right. And when the heart of man is right, then this world is going to be a better place. But we know it's not going to get better. We know there's a day coming. Praise the Lord, there's a day coming when it'll be the rapture, and we will be out of here. The church will be taken out of here, and we've got nothing but good things to look forward to. But for the here and now, we want to be sure that we, we guard our heart. We want to look and be sure that we take care of ourselves. We're in 2 Corinthians. I want to read this verse to you and we'll close. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. Satan has the world blinded. We witness and we wonder why we can't get through because Satan has the world blinded, kind of like we've seen the blind leading the blind there. But with the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel brings in the light. And when the light comes in, uh, Tim was talking about that earlier, when the light comes in, the, the darkness is dispelled. And it don't take much light. You know that? You guys, it was in where it's really dark. You, you don't have big floodlights. You got those lights on your, your hats, your hard hats. It don't take a lot of light to dispel the darkness, does it? And that's the truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what? You don't have to die for your sin. You can be forgiven of sin, be cleansed, and have eternal life. How do you get to do that? You need to repent. You need to turn to God. Turn to God and put your faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as payment for your sin. He shed the blood to pay the price for your sin. So you didn't have to because you couldn't. God the Father said, I need a sinless sacrifice. And so he sent Jesus to be that sinless sacrifice. And the Son of God came down here and he went to that cross and shed his innocent blood to pay for our sins. All the sins of the world, saved and unsaved, the blood was shed for all the sins of the world. But only those that repent and put their faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone as the, for the forgiveness of sin for their, as their Savior have eternal life. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to be preaching at a funeral tonight. A gay freshly died here the other day, and I'll be preaching over at her funeral tonight. Gay was a Christian lady. She'd been a Christian for a long time. And so you can go there and have a call based on her professional faith. It's not because she was a nice person, not because she did good things or anything else. It's because she trusted Christ that you can have that confidence. You, that, that you can have that confidence. And, and really, in the end, only he and she knows that the idea is that we, when you have a loved one that died in Christ, you know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It is, listen, death is kind of scary sometimes, but it is the gateway to joy and happiness and peace that's immeasurable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day and for this time. We pray you would be with each one of us. As your children, as we walk this pathway of life, we pray that our heart would be right to you, Lord, and that we would be mindful to, to watch our heart and make sure that we live the kind of life that is a blessing to you and a blessing to others. And for those who don't know Christ, we pray, Father, this might be a day, this might be the time that they would turn, repent, and put their faith and trust in Jesus. That the blood has been shed, the price has been paid. All they need to do is by faith receive that precious gift of eternal life that comes through that shed blood. We thank you and praise you for loving us. We thank you for what you're going to do in us and through us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Debbie, you want to